All right, welcome to uh, the next installment of our Andrew Lemus figure drawing for what's worth. And so far we've gone through all this, all this, and now we're going to be going through these things. And hopefully I'll be able to get through each block for one video. But let's not jump ahead. Let's go ahead and just concentrate on the bones and muscles, the requirements of successful figure drawing. So um, some of this text I want to read through because it's really important. And I just I just don't think that I can cover it through filtered through my through my perception. So I think that it's best that I just read some through this because it's really important. And it's really it's really um, a lot of good information to, to have. So let, let's go ahead and read through this. The bones and muscles. The further you go in the study of anatomy, the more interesting it becomes. Made of soft and pliable material, elastic yet strong, capable of unlimited movement and of performing countless tasks, operating on self-generated power, and repairing or renewing itself over a period of time in which the strongest of steel parts would wear out. The human body is indeed an engineering miracle. On the opposite page, the male and female skeletons have been set up. I have kept the head units alongside so that you may relate the bones to the figure in correct proportion. The skeleton, though strong, is really not so rigid as it appears. Though the spine has a rigid base in the pelvis, it possesses great flexibility. And the ribs too, though they are fastened firmly into the spine, are flexible. All the bones are held together and upright by cartilage and muscle and the joints operate on a ball and socket plan with a stop for stability. The whole structure collapses with a loss of consciousness. Strain upon the muscles can usually be transferred to the bony structure. The weight of the heavy load, for example, is largely taken over by the bones, leaving the muscles free to propel the limbs. Bones also form a protection to delicate organs and parts. The skull protects the eyes, the brain, and the delicate inner parts of the throat. The ribs and pelvis protect the heart, lungs, and other organs. Where protection is most needed, the bone comes closest to the surface. It is very important for the artist to know that no bone is perfectly straight. An arm or a leg drawn with perfectly straight bone will be rigid and stiff looking. Curvature in the bones has much to do with the rhythm and function of a figure. It helps it make it appear alive. The chief differences between the male and female skeletons are the proportionally larger pelvis in the female and proportionally larger thorax or rib cage in the male. These differences account for the wider shoulders and narrow hips of the male, the longer waistline, lower buttocks, and wider hips of the female. They also cause the female arms to flare out wider when they are swinging back and forth and the femur or thigh bone to be a little more oblique. The hair and breasts, of course, distinguish the female figure but they are merely its most obvious characteristics. The female is different from head to toe. The jaw is less developed. The neck is more slender. The hands are more smaller and more delicate. The muscles of the arms are smaller and much less in evidence. The waistline is higher. The great trochanter of the femur extends out further. The buttocks are fuller, rounder, and lower. The thighs are flatter and wider. The calf is much less developed. The angles and wrists are smaller. The feet are smaller and more arched. The muscle in general are less prominent, more strap-like, all but those of thighs and buttocks, which are proportionally larger and stronger in the female. This extra strength is, like the larger pelvis, designed to carry the extra burden of an unborn child. Concentrate upon the fundamental differences until you can set up an unmistakable male or female figure at will. Note the black squares of the male skeleton. These are bony prominences which the bones are so near the surface that they affect the contour. When the body becomes fat, these spots become dimples or recessions in the surface. In thin or aged figures, the bones protrude. Here he's talking about what I've been talking about since uh, the, uh, the Bern Hogarth videos. What I'm talking about drawing from a life. Working from life or photographs will not eliminate the necessity of knowing anatomy and proportion. You should recognize what the humps and bumps are and why they are. 
Otherwise, your drawing will have the look of inflated rubber or a wax department store dummy. The final work of any commission of importance should be drawn from a model or a good copy of some kind, since it must compete with the work of men who use models in good copy. Most artists own or operate a camera as a help, but it will not do the whole job. Outlines traced from a photograph because of the exaggerated foreshortening by the lenses have a wide and dumpy look. Limbs look short and heavy. Hands and feet appear too large. If these distortions are not corrected, your life drawing will simply look photographic. So it's really important to understand these fundamentals when you look at a model because you just can't, you just can't copy a photograph. You just can't trace a photograph. Because if you do, you're not drawing from, from life. You're drawing from a photograph. You're copying a photograph. You're not copying life. And... Photography is very important. I mean, it, it eliminated artists. It, it eliminated the, as far as uh, portrait painters or painters in general, it eliminated all that. But there's still room for for good art to be accepted in the world because photography, as it is important, it doesn't do the whole job as far as a painting. And it's important to understand that. And if you're looking at, if you're doing a... Um, a figure drawing class with the models in front of you. When you draw what you see, sometimes it doesn't look right. A photograph is like the foundation, but your knowledge of anatomy is the the bricks and mortar and and wood and the things that that build to make it make it more appealing. So here he goes on. It might as well mention here some of the requirements of successful figure drawing. The smart figure. It might be well to mention here some of the requirements of successful figure drawing. The smart female figure has some mannish contours. The shoulders are drawn a little wider than normal. With much slope, the hips are a little narrower. The thighs and legs are made longer and more slender with tapering calves. When the legs are together, they should touch at the knee. When the legs are together, they should touch at the thigh, knee, and ankle. The knees should be small. The leg is elongated from the knee down with small ankles. It is merely a waste of time to show an art director a figure that is large-headed, narrow-shouldered, short-armed or legged, wide-hipped, short, fat, dumby, or pudgy. But a figure may be actually bony and unusually tall and still please a fashion editor. Slimness in figure drawing has become almost a cult. What the middle... What the artists of the Middle Ages consider a voluptuous appeal would be plain fat today. So there's, you know, as history goes goes on, it's um, it's fair to say that tastes change, you know, and and tastes change through um, what is presented before you and what what is pre presented before you in media, in news, and pop culture. Nothing will kill a sale so quickly as a fatness or shortness. It is curious fact that the short people are apt to draw short figures. A man with a short wife will tend to draw short women. If my figures seem absurdly tall, remember that I am giving you the conception accepted as a standard. They will not look too tall to the art buyer. In fact, some of my figures are even shorter than I would instinctively draw them. The essence of successful male figure drawing is that it be kept masculine. Plenty of bone and muscle. The face should be lean, the cheeks slightly hollowed, the eyebrows fairly thick, never in a thin line, the mouth full, the chin prominent and well-defined. The figure is, of course, wide-shouldered and at least six feet or eight or more heads tall. Unfortunately, it is not easy to find these lean-faced, hard-muscled male models. They are, usually, they are usually at harder work. Children should be drawn fairly close to the scale of proportions given in this book. Babies obviously should be plump, nibbled, and healthy and squishy. Special studies should be given to the folds and creases at the neck, wrists, and ankles. The cheeks are full and round. The chin is well under. The upper lip protrudes somewhat. The nose is round, small, and concave at the bridge. The ears are small, thick, and round. The eyes practically fill the openings. The hands are fat and dimpled, and there is considerable taper to the short fingers. Until the structure of babies is well understood, it is almost fatal to try to draw them without good working material. Keep all children up to six or eight years quite chubby. From eight to twelve, they can be drawn very 
Much as they appear, the relative size of the head should be a little larger than normal. If you get into character drawing, you may do a fat fellow, but don't make him too young. Do not draw ears too large or protruding in any male drawing. The male hand should be exaggerated a little in size and in the ideal type must look bony and muscular. Soft, round hands on a man simply won't go. The art director seldom points out your faults. He simply says he does not like your drawing. Any one of the above mistakes may account for his dislike. Ignorance of the demands upon you is as great a handicap as ignorance of anatomy. So I, I felt I felt it was important to, to read through this um, because he, he covers a lot of important notes as far as what he thinks should be right. And like I said, you know, taste change through history, but this is these the, these were his tastes. So I've been trying to figure out a way to make this entertaining because it is just it is just schematics of anatomy of how the the arms how the muscles in the arms rotate and and work together as they turn and 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 do this stuff. And um I'm gonna try my best to not make this boring, but one thing that Andrew Lemus wants us to do is to learn all the the names of all the the muscles. Because further on the book, he wants give us a, gives us a test of, of what we learned, and some some um, some things I know, like the gluteus maximus, the buttocks, um, the deltoid, and the biceps. You know, those are things that that come naturally to the mind when when drawing. But one thing that Andrew Loomis does is he mentions um, George Bridgman because he's talking about there are, there is no other way to acquire knowledge of anatomy than to dig it out, quote unquote. Stay with it until you can draw the muscles from memory. Get further books on the subject. Arthur recommends the books by George Bridgman is excellent. So, you know, you can go back to the George Bridgman stuff that I worked on you know, previously and, and, and learn that. Now also he talks about artistic anatomy by Walter F. Moses. In these books, the subject is more ex expertly covered and much more complete. It pays to know, so stay with it. Okay, so what I've done here is I've set up my schematics of what we learned in the previous videos. Eight heads high. Everything that we learned in the previous videos, I've go ahead and established here. So I can go ahead and put in some of the bones to make it entertaining and, and learn more of a, a learning experience other than, you know, just looking at a book. So um, now I'm going to focus on the important bones and I'm going to use, I'm going to try to use this blue. So first is a scapula, scapula. And this is like a bone, it, it, it protrudes. This is the humerus right here. This is the first part of the arm. Uh, and then we go to the ulna. So we have our scapula, clavicle here. Let me erase this. Okay. Um, this is our humerus and this is the ulna and it, the ulna, it wraps around. And then 
this part comes around here. So we have our scapula, humerus, ulna, radius, and then our clavicle. This right here is important bone right here. It kind of comes across here like that. Okay, so now we're going to go to uh, the other side. And um, we'll go with the clavicle. Here's our clavicle right here. Scapula, and our humerus. Um, you know, I got the rib cage in here, so it's a little bit of the rib cage just to. Make you some appeal. It's a rib cage. And then scapulates extends out. You can really look at a scapula. And you know you could do uh, you know word association scapula um, is is sounds like spatula scapula spatula clavicle clavicle is um, a vehicle I think a vehicle clavicle vehicle humerus um, humor so humor humor. Clavicle, scapula. You know, I don't know how important it is to know these, but if you want to be a master, if you want to be a master at this, I mean, you should you should know these names, and and it would definitely give you the one up over other artists. You know, when you because most artists don't know, you know, any of these names except for the basics. But if you, I think if you you would have one up over artists if you if you knew all the names of the of the bones and the muscles. Okay, so next is um, the pelvis region. So we have our pelvis, which is right here. around there and then you have these holes right here I don't know you know why they're there but they're there right there there's this hole right there I'm always interested in how that is um, here we have our sacrum. This is our sacrum. And then um, we have our femur, which is this guy right here. It's like the socket that works here and then comes down like this. Kind of like that. And then we have our patella. Which is this bone here? We have our tibula, which is about here. 
And then we have our fibula that goes behind it. That. And then um, we have the back view, which is um, here right here. And um, I would start with, I would start with the, the femur, number three. No one like that. And that one join here, our hip bone. And one like that. This is, uh, go ahead and establish our, what we just learned here. Let's see, let's move this over a little bit. Clavicle. And a bone here, a rib. Okay. This one here. So this is the pectoralis major. So this is like the major pec. It comes over like this. It like extends over here. Like that. So That folds over here. And then the pec, so that's the pec major. There's a pec mi a minor. It's got to be underneath because you don't see it. So I don't know. Come down here. All right. But the pec minor is there. They're kind of like, like that. Ceratus mag magnus. And here it's like they attached themselves to the ribs. Let's work on our deltoids. So the deltoid is, this is our deltoid. This is our biceps. Our pick, our major pick. A latimus dor dorsi. The latimus dorsi is right there, where it breaks right there. That's our latimus dorsi here. And then we have our serratus magnus. These are the serratus magnus, and these are muscles. They're not bone, they're muscle. So now let's go to um, our neck muscles. So this is the sternomastoid. This guy right here. The sternomastoid. And then you have your trest trapeze, trapezius, this is our trapezius muscle, and then we have our sternoid, sterno, sternoid, sternoid is this muscle in here, we have our That is our sternoid. And then we have our trapezius, 
which is this right here, trapezius. And our sternomastoid is this guy right here. That's the major one. You see that in all drawings. Sternomastius. Okay, so you have those, those guys right there. So we've already established that. We've already established our deltoid, which is right here. We have our pecs. Our biceps. Our serratus magnus. Okay, now we're going into external oblique. And our external oblique. Right there, it's a big, huge, massive muscle right there. Next is the gluteus medius. So here, there's a separation here. Um, and here you got your abs here, so of course you got your abs. You have one, one, two, three, five. It extends down here. And then um, we have this, this thing called the, the Sartorus. The Sartorus. Starts from here and goes across to here. It's like a, it covers these right here. And then we have our gluteus medius, which is I guess part of the gluteus maximus. We have our tensor facae litae, a lot of medical terms here. But if you want one over other artists, learn these learn these names. Because most of them don't know, even me. Okay, so then we have a series of muscles here. One, two, three. And then you have the you have this main muscle here. And then this one guy right here. Okay. So here we have the, this is the satyrus. This muscle right here is the satyrus. And then you have these muscles here. And each one has its own name. I'm not going to go into those. Here we have gluteus medius here. And then um, this thing called the tensor. You have your rectus femoris. We're going to go into this here. This is the shin bone. That's our shin bone. Our shin bone. We have our calf here. Calf. And then we have two muscles here. One here, one here. We have our tibulus anicus there. And that's our muscles for our leg.
So um, let's go ahead and start drawing the arm the way we have it. So here, we have our deltoid. Um, our bicep. triceps there brachialis anticus right here supernator longus is right here and then we are extensor carpi radialis right here And then we have our extensor commonus, which is right here. And then we have our extensor of the thumb. So the extensor of the thumb, like right there. Okay, and then nine is the fever carpi onerous. right here so you can see there's so much in there and then um, 10 would be the prone pronator terrace which is right here the pronator terrace and then 11 is our flexor carpi radialis radialis, our flexor carpi radialis, which is right here. And 9 to 13, and then uh, you actually wouldn't see that on the surface you know see a lot of artists like they tell you draw their their anatomy look what it's supposed to look like on the outside but actually it's the inside here it would be the supinator longus the supinator longus would be right there followed by the extensor carpi radialis right there. Followed by the extensor commonus, which would be right there. Uh, followed by the thumb, extensor of the thumb. And then um, the flexor carpi. Flexure carpi onerous right there. So that's if this hand was turned inward. Okay, so now I'm just going to play around with what I just learned and um, do some really uh, some really cool anatomy. So let's try it. And, uh, 